Now I get the opportunity uh, to, to welcome Baz. Baz Shouten uh, is here uh, to talk to us next. Uh, Baz is a uh, tech lead uh, working on uh, uh, Firefox performance tooling uh, at Mozilla uh, and also has a history. Those bells are, can everyone else hear those bells? Okay, that's, that's, that's a relief. That's not a good omen, is it for you, Baz? Like the bells tolling for you? Uh, or maybe you requested it, I don't know. But uh, there, we, there we are, that's the, that's the mark of the hour, I guess. Uh, but Baz also has a history uh, in computer graphics and, and like squeezing performance out of GPUs and, uh, and also kind of working with OpenGL. So has you know, very interesting uh, background in terms of uh, performance. Now kind of concentrating a little bit more on kind of benchmarking and what happens and also caring for all browsers and thinking about how uh, the, the variety of browsers available to us is important and thinking about the tooling uh, that exists in those. So uh, not surprising then that, that Baz works uh, at Firefox, uh, sorry, at Mozilla working on the, the tooling uh, in, in Firefox. So uh, I think we should hear from him next. Are you ready for your next talk? <laughs> it's the best I can. Are you ready for your next talk? I'm so proud of you. Bravo. Please, a huge welcome to the stage. It's Baz Shouten. Thank you. We're all here to talk about performance. And the reason for that is obviously because we've all heard this statistic, right? One second of an improvement to page load means a 27% increase in conversion rate. But what does that mean? It means that one second improvement to page load, you could be selling 27% more products or something along those lines, right? These next couple of days, most of what you'll be hearing about is going to be helping you improve your websites. I'm Bas Schouten. I am a principal engineer for Mozilla, and I am the tech lead for Firefox Performance. And I'm going to be talking about how, what we can do as browsers to help your websites be faster. In reality, performance, applying performance best practices to your sites and services is much more likely to move the needle to you, for your user more significantly than anything that we as browser engineers can really do. However, the unique leverage that we have as browser engines is that improvements to the engine diffuse quickly and across the web. And they apply to all users and all websites. And so to really make the web fast is an industry-wide effort. And we need both. We need you advocating performance and best practices to your teams. And we need browsers bringing cumulative improvements to the web, making it faster for all users. And so today, I'm going to talk about how we as browsers can become better at doing that. And I'm going to do that in that. I know, I, well, now you should be. It should have just been black. <laughs> Is it there now? There you go. <laughs> so this was going to come in as dramatic effect, right? But sadly, that didn't happen. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Speedometer 3. We've been fortunate to work with Google and Apple at standardizing a new way of benchmarking performance in browsers. So there's a couple of things I'm going to be talking about. First of all, I'm going to give a brief history of browser benchmarking so that we understand a little bit more of the landscape and how this came to be. Then we're going to talk more specifically about how Speedometer 3, how the idea evolved, and what it is now. As the next step, logically, we'll be talking about what Speedometer is measuring and how, what kind of workloads are in the benchmark and how do we pick those workloads. And finally, I will be talking about our experiences optimizing for this benchmark in Firefox. And I'm going to look at some real user monitoring to see whether we succeeded. So I'm guessing I need to stand closer. There we go. So first, a brief history of browser benchmarks. For the early years of the web, testing the performance in browsers was sort of a niche thing. 
and it was happening in most browser engine code bases, but there wasn't much interest outside of that. Slow network connections and static pages meant that the performance of the rendering engine on the early web was not that important for the experience that people were having. As the web became more dynamic, it wasn't until the second browser wars erupted in the mid-2000s that an interest for benchmarks started to evolve. As the technical press was writing one article after the other about what the best browser is and why you should be one, using one browser over the other, they turned to benchmarks to provide them with a quantitative way of comparing the performance of browsers in an authoritative manner. And so what the most popular benchmarks were shifted over time. But generally, there was always one benchmark, or maybe two, that were dominating most of the public discourse. The first benchmark that was widely used was SunSpider, developed by Apple and released in 2007. It measured the duration of a number of workloads with a focus on latency. In 2010, Mozilla released a benchmark called Kraken. It never really became widely documented. And the real shift came when Google released Octane in 2012. Octane was a benchmark that focused much more on complex algorithmic workloads. It had more of a focus on throughput. A couple of years later again, Apple released Jetstream and Speedometer 1. At this time, Jetstream got most of the attention. Jetstream contained a combination of benchmarks of workloads from uh, SunSpider, Ares, Octane, Kraken, and a number of others. Um, and it tried to be a more balanced benchmark, but it continued to have issues. And in 2018, Apple released Speedometer 2. Speedometer 2 was developed with some collaboration from Google as well, and it was a huge improvement over the benchmarks we had at the time. Speedometer 2 measures a number of operations in a small to-do application called to-do MVC, and it then computes some times, asynchronous time and asynchronous time. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means later. And it assigns a score to that. While that was a big improvement to benchmarking the web, there were still a number of issues. For one, what these benchmarks still did was they forced us as browser vendors into a choice. Are we going to spend resources making our score on a benchmark better? Or are we going to focus on making our browser faster while maybe ignoring some of the perceived performance in our benchmark scores? These choices were not always aligned. And sometimes they were even in direct conflict. Sometimes a change which actually increases your score on a benchmark actually makes the real user experience worse, which is, of course, a situation that isn't great. And so let's look at what some of the reasons are for these challenges. First of all, there is representativity. Most of these benchmarks focused on complex, highly measurable, long-lasting workloads. If we look at Jetstream, for example, it has a cryptography library, a 3D ray tracer, a JS implementation of a regular expression parser, a JS implementation of a Gaussian blur. Needless to say, these are not generally the things that your websites are doing in JavaScript. They have a strong algorithmic JS focus, which is different from the type of JavaScript that you are running. And on top of that, the real web is ever evolving. These benchmarks have tended to be released once and then used for years, which means that as the web evolved, they became even less representative of what the real web looked like. And finally, all of these benchmarks were developed by one of the vendors. And that means that they were optimized and tested on one browser. They were developed by experts on that particular browser. And without even trying, that means you end up tailoring to and avoiding performance cliffs in that particular engine. And if that's not enough, there's, of course, also product marketing interests that can play a role in when you're developing or releasing a benchmark. And all of this means that there is an opportunity 
for the web performance community to do better. And so one question you can, of course, have is, is what does make a browser fast? How do you determine how fast a browser is? And why don't you use real user monitoring? Like, like, like this man. I, I found this while I was researching this talk, uh, and they already figured out the answer uh, back in 2012. The fastest browser, quite, quite hands down, really, if you look at it, uh, you know, 40% faster than any of the others, is Internet Explorer. So I'm afraid that the, the web has really regressed over the last couple of years, because we'll have to do without that. But why don't we use real user monitoring, right? Well, aside from the fact that page load is a notoriously bad metric for the actual user experience, even if we're using other metrics, such as largest contentful paint, there are numerous reasons that RUM can never be the driver for proactive browser optimizations. And so we get to speedometer three and how that came about. So what are the advantages of having a benchmark? One of the first and, and primary advantages is that benchmarks are proactive in, terms of, in development terms rather than reactive. Benchmarks provide a way to test features and code before they actually reach users, while real user monitoring can help optimize a browser through A-B experimentation and longer feedback loops. Benchmarks can test them in the lab. All browsers have certain quality control methodologies, right? At Firefox, for example, if you regress a benchmark, it triggers a regression alert. That regression alert feeds into a process where a bug is filed, and if the regression cannot be adequately explained, the patch is backed out, right? And all of this happens before the code ever reaches users. But at least it's important because is that these can be run locally and in the lab. And so that means that ideas that aren't quite ready to be shipped to users can be tested using them. And we can make decisions. We can iterate on ideas faster and discard the ideas that don't work much faster than we ever could if we were using real user monitoring. And that means that benchmarks help guide fast and good decision making by browser vendors. At least as important, browsers help us with competitive analysis. And this is to all our advantages, right? We can't do that with real user monitoring. We can't compare the real user data coming out of Firefox and compare it to data coming out of Chrome, or take data coming out of Chrome and compare it to data coming out of Safari. These are not the same groups of users. They're in different locations. They're using different devices. They might be running other background processes because they might be more likely to use one browser at home versus using one browser at the office, right? And so benchmarks allow us to run the same workload in a consistent environment. In addition to that, for competitive analysis, they allow us to build a shared understanding of what needs to be fast. It means that we all, that all competitors know what it means to deliver a good web engine. And all of this is good for the web. And it's good for browser choice. And it's good for engine developers as well. And so this started because in the summer, did that work? Oh, there we go. <laughs> and how this started was in the summer of 2021. Google had developed a number of extensions to Speedometer 2. They had added some new workloads, made some methodology changes, and they came to Mozilla and said, we really want to do something with this, and we don't want to do it by ourselves this time. By the winter of 2021, we'd internally reviewed the benchmark that they'd created, and we'd concluded that there was a legitimate opportunity to build something that was better than what we had. One of the primary requirements for Mozilla was that we wanted this to be a truly joint project. We, we contacted Apple, and we spoke with them about the benchmark. And they agreed. They saw value in this. 
And in the summer of 2022, we agreed on a joint governance structure, and the joint governance model was landed into the now public WebKit speedometer repository. Microsoft and Intel joined Google, Apple, and Mozilla for weekly cross-vendor meetings, starting to develop the actual benchmark. And in December 2022, there was a tweet, or you know, X, I don't know what to call it these days, where Microsoft, Mozilla, and Google, or sorry, Google, Apple, and Mozilla made an announcement announcing Speedometer 3. Speedometer 3 was now born. And so what are the goals of Speedometer? First of all, Speedometer provides a place where browser vendors can talk to each other and align on what should be fast. It allows us to have a shared definition of what it means to be a good implementation of the web. And when doing that, it has other advantages, because we don't have to make all those decisions based on what is most popular in our core in the core places where we ship, right? Or for the majority of people. We can look at things such as accessibility or language features that are only used by a couple of smaller languages in the world. And we can include them in the benchmark. And now there is a real incentive for browser developers to make sure that they perform well. And that can lead to a better web experience for everyone. Another core goal of the benchmark is that it needs to allow for effective optimizations. It needs to not have the issue that I spoke about earlier. It needs to make sure that when a browser has a higher score on the benchmark, that means that it actually has become faster for real users. It can't be encouraging overfitting for specific APIs, specific frameworks, or specific workloads and it needs to not contain micro-benchmarks that encourage browsers to optimize very specific little things that are never going to actually be noticeable for a real user. And if we get this right, that means that browsers can safely dedicate their resources to improving these scores, improving the perception of the performance of the browsers, while at the same time making the web faster for everyone and your users. Now, what are the principles, then, that we build the benchmark on? First of all, and I think I teased this a little bit, joint governance. The benchmark is under a joint governance model, and what that means in practice is that all major changes to the benchmark that change the score or that add a workload are added by consensus between the three major browser engines, so Gecko, WebKit, and Blink. It means that the workloads need to be based on real applications. It means that the model provides for community involvement and community contributions so that all of you can help us make sure that the benchmarks workloads are re representative of the types of things that you are doing. We are planning a regular cadence of updates after the release of Speedometer 2 to make sure that the benchmark stays up to date with what the web looks like at this point in time, or at that point in time. And finally, it needs to be simple. The benchmark needs to run in any tab without special tooling. And it needs to be quick. It needs to be fast enough that a user can look at it to make a browser choice so that the tech press can run it when writing an article. And finally, it needs to provide what all benchmarks have done over the years, a sing still provide a single authoritative score that tells us how well a benchmark performed. All of this sounds pretty obvious, but it is actually quite hard. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we define the workloads that now make up Speedometer 3. So, defining new workloads. First, let's talk a little bit about what speedometer measures. 
Here you can see a profile of speedometer of one specific workload. You can see that there's these two things. There's a sync time and an async time. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Each workload consists of a number of JavaScript commands that simulate certain user interactions right, and that trigger a bunch of work. The synchronous time is relatively easy. You put some performance timings around those actual JavaScript commands, you execute them, and you measure how long it took. And that's your sync time, voila, easy. The async time is a little harder. What you're trying to capture in the async time is all the things the browser does next to ensure that whatever that workload is trying to do has actually shown up for your users. And that's tricky. It can be tricky because it may not, you may not be measuring the same things between browsers. So what we've actually done is we've, we've included um, a measurement based on request animation frame, um, set timeout zero, force layout, and we've put a bunch of those things together in kind of a clever way. And that actually gives us a pretty good approximation in all of the browsers between how much time the browser took to actually display that content. If you look at this, you can see that up here, those, those times actually, they have a little bit of different things in them, right? If you look at the sync time for this particular test, there is uh, quite a bit of layout here, the purple that you see here. And if we look at the async time, there's actually a significant block of JavaScript, which is the yellow here then some layout, some painting, and some other things, some styling. And so this is actually capturing most of the relevant work um, that is happening in these benchmarks, or that is happening in these workloads. And so the next question is, how do we actually decide what workloads to run? And that's not easy. The first approach that we considered is one that was focused on technologies. You would pick a couple of things, right? Like, I want SVG, I want some Canvas, something like that. And then you would start building an application around those technologies. The problem is that already violated, kind of, as you start doing that, one of the core means of the benchmark. You start developing a benchmark that is actually developing that is actually measuring that particular technology rather than the real user application that we were talking about, it very easily becomes unrealistic and you start overfitting for the particular technologies that you're choosing. And some technologies may actually be much more common across different applications. And those deserve to get more coverage in a benchmark, right? Another approach that we considered was taking existing applications but that provides issues on its own. First of all, you have to decide what are the interactions with that application that I'm going to measure. That's not obvious from just saying, I have Slack or I have Gmail, right? And then there's logistical limitations. How do, I, how do you actually reduce those into a measurable workload? How do you make them measurable? And perhaps an even more important logistical implementation most real applications that people use a lot are closed source. Even if you can somehow extract the source code or get at it in another way, you wouldn't be able to ship it, probably, in an open source benchmark. And so where this idea seemed interesting, it also wasn't what we ended up doing. And the direction we ended up coming, going into was that we defined user journeys that were important on the real web and that with people we're going to care about. Around those user journeys, we built a realistic application using the most common libraries, the best practices for implementing an application like this, and we designed it with measurability in mind, right? Because in the end, we do have to measure the times. This is more labor intensive than any of the other options that we considered. However, it does make for much better workloads that are more representative of the real web. And it is the methodology that ended up guiding our decisions for most of the workloads. So now, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about what actually ended up in the benchmark. First of all, 
there's the trusty to-do MVC. How many of you actually recognize this from running a benchmark, this particular thing? Great. So this is what Speedometer 2 was all about, right? It was a to-do MVC application that was just a little to-do application called to-do MVC. It was implemented on a number of different benchmarks and with a number of different best practices in mind. And then it added some to-do items, and it checked them, and then it deleted them. And it measured how long that took. And that's great, but it was a pretty limited thing, right? It was one little user journey. And it did it on a whole bunch of different frameworks. What we've done for Speedometer 3 is we've done that thing that we spoke about, where we keep it up to date with the real time. Some frameworks, like Inferno, were retired. Other frameworks, like React and Vue, were updated to use the most commonly used versions of those libraries, of those frameworks on the web at this point in time. And those may not necessarily be the latest, right? We introduced some new frameworks that weren't around or weren't popular when Speedometer 2 was built. Uh, Svelte was added. Lit was added. And so that updated this so that we still have this user journey. We still have this broad coverage of the different frameworks, except modernized for the modern web. But like I said, this was pretty simple, right? And it didn't really look like a real application that much. And so engineers at Microsoft actually contributed something where they embedded this particular um, application into a much larger complex DOM. We asked them to make it look like a realistic application. And this is what came out, right? It looks a little bit like a thing that you might expect a little to-do application to run in. And it provides a much more realistic layout tree, much more realistic CSS style sheets and things like that, right? And while it may not be obvious, considering the workloads that we run here are identical, we're checking the same, we're adding the same items, we're checking the same checkboxes, and we're deleting them again. It may not be obvious that that should be slower, but in every single browser, there was a significant increase in the duration of the tests when we made these changes. Because there is a more complex DOM to render. There is more CSS rules to match. right? And so we believe that this is a significant improvement in the representativity of the to-do MVC workload. Another thing that people care about on the web is looking at charts. Perhaps most of us, more than some others, but everybody uses charts in some way, right? Whether it's about the economy, whether it's about the stock market, whether it's about web performance, right? And so we did that. We included a number of chart workloads. And those are an interesting area. Because as we looked into that user journey, there are so many libraries to choose from. And there's not only a bunch of different libraries. There is actually a bunch of different technologies inside the browsers, right? Some use Canvas. Others use SVG. There exist even some that use WebGL. We ended up having four different workloads. There is um, React stock charts, observable plot, you probably won't be surprised to hear that Chart.js is the other one used to implement uh, the workloads. And there's my personal favorite, which is Perf Dashboard. And Perf Dashboard is kind of cool because the workload was built based on Apple's performance monitoring tools. So that means Perf Dashboard is now monitoring the performance of Perf Dashboard. So that's kind of a cool little meta trick. On top of that, there is something that I think we all do on the web for sure, and I was doing it as I was preparing for this talk, and it's editing. And in order to do that, we've added an editor workload. So there's two different types of editing that we've considered. One of them is code editing, and the other is rich text editing, right? Just a large document. We've added two different workloads, uh, one of them basically takes a very large, um, one of them is in TipTap, and it basically takes a very large, complex document, and it changes some of the layout on that document. The other uses CodeMirror. It takes a whole bunch of code, and it changes some syntax highlighting options. And that way, we hope to provide 
decent coverage for all the internals of that, what these editor libraries might be using. Right? Finally, there is still that little challenge that is always hard for a benchmark, especially if you don't not using any tooling with the browser. And that is static pages. We considered the user journey of accessing a new site and switching between pages on that site, right? And that is, it's not obvious how we can measure that in something that runs in a tab. And so we couldn't really do page load. So we used uh, both, have implemented a news website in both Next.js and Nux.js. And we kind of found out that that way, if we use a little bit of clever trickery, we can get something that is very, very close to what actually happens when a page is loading inside the browser. And so this is kind of our attempt to have some coverage of actually static page loads inside the benchmark. And with that, we get to the list. I'm not going to mention all of them again. Feel free to look at the repository. Remember, all of this is open source. Um, but yeah, these are all the workloads in a new benchmark. And please remember that this is not final. When we are iterating, we're not just looking to update. We are looking to expand. We are looking at ideas as to how to expand our methodologies such that we can still run inside a tab, but actually measure more types of things. As I said, the benchmark is open source. You're all welcome to contribute and provide ideas and tell us what we've gotten wrong or what we could do better. But finally, I want to talk a little bit about our experiences using this benchmark to improve Firefox. So when we are improving Firefox, we do so using the Firefox profiler, right? And so if you look at this is kind of a view of the profile UI. And we've tried to do some things as we develop Speedometer 3 to actually make it more usable for browser developers to actually use it to optimize. And so one of the things we've done, if we've added these performance markers, you can see them here, right? We've seen them before when I talked about this methodology. There's all these performance markers that tell us exactly when the workloads were running. And now we can use those performance markers to filter out the samples of the profile that are actually relevant to this particular workload. And that means that we can look at exactly what a benchmark is trying to measure. If we look here, we can see almost immediately when we do that, right? We can see that we filtered here. And now we can see that almost all of that time inside the workload is spent in this canvas event ring buffer thing, wait on read count or something like that. And so that is basically us just sitting there waiting for the canvas to actually render its content. Now that's kind of interesting. So you dive into that a little bit further, which we can do because of the filters. Yeah. And then we find out that if we look at the entire benchmark run for this particular test, which is the chart.js test for the record, 34% of our time is spent here for a total of 760 samples. And this is not some contrived benchmark, right? This wasn't us writing a benchmark for Canvas and flooding it with commands and then going, oh, look, we filled it up, right? This was running a real website, running a real framework, and doing a rendering of a plain chart. And we were hitting those limits, right? And so now we knew that we have a problem. And once we know we have a problem, we can go and spend some time on it. This profile was taken at the start of this year. And if you look carefully at the brown boxes here, they represent the measurements of the benchmark. Here is a profile that I took a couple of weeks ago. We can see that these boxes have shortened significantly. If we look at that particular function that we looked at before, we can see that it now has a total of 144 samples. And remember that before, those were 760. So the wall clock time of this particular function has reduced quite a bit. And on top of that, <laughs> and on top of that, that 144 samples is an 80% reduction 
but the total time, or the percentage of the time it took went from 34 to 16 percent. So in that time, we apparently made lots of other stuff in this benchmark faster as well. So that's great news. And then let's look at that, what that means for our benchmark score. This is a plot of the score on Speedometer 3 for Firefox builds starting in February this year to today, or a couple of weeks ago. If we look at this, we can see that there is a 40% increase to the score of the benchmark. And we can see that that comes from a couple of the, these large jumps in different places, which were, you know, sort of big flaws or big ideas that we had based on profiling these workloads in the benchmark. And they were big improvements that we were able to make to the browser. And we can also see that in between those, there's a gradual upward slope, which represents all the other little things that we were able to do by getting teams to focus and look at these workloads. But of course, I've talked to you before about how we don't really want just optimizing for a benchmark score, right? Looking at a benchmark score is all well and good, but it doesn't really tell us whether users are having a better experience. And so we do want to look at real user monitoring. And so the first number I want to talk to you about is the time from receiving the first byte over the network, because we weren't really optimizing the network connections here, right? To the first contentful paint. I wish we could have used largest contentful paint. I, I do apologize, but I have been promised that largest contentful paint is coming to Firefox this week and will be in Nightly. But we're going to have to do with far first contentful paint for now, because that's what we've been tracking for the last year. And we see this. And if we look at this, this is the median, right? Be careful. This doesn't start at zero, obviously. We haven't made them instant yet. Uh, but it starts at roughly 255 milliseconds at the start of the year. And the median drops down to 215 milliseconds. That's a 50 millisecond improvement, or a 45 millisecond improvement to first contentful paint, right? To the first change that somebody sees when they're trying to load a new page. And that's a great result in itself already, right? You can see, by the way, that this is not just the web getting faster. I, I can see how that would be a tempting explanation, but if you look at these little areas here where the big movements take place, those are all uh, when a Firefox release occurred, right? This is all data coming from release. Now, we did look a little bit about what did we make faster? How did that happen? And so another metric that we track is the time that we spent executing JavaScript code between a navigation start and the onload event, right? So this is basically the time that we spent, how fast we are able to execute the JavaScript on pages. And for this particular metric, we are going to look at the 95th percentile because that represents those pages with the heaviest JavaScript, right? Those represent the pages that we are really need to make faster. And if we look at that number, we get, see something even cooler. When we look at that, we see that that was hovering around 1,600 to 1,650 milliseconds, 1 1.6 seconds of just running JavaScript. And today, it is hovering around 1,250 to 1,300 milliseconds. That means that we are spending 300 milliseconds less on at least 5% of all pages before the page load event. If you look at the median, you see improvements of up to 100 milliseconds, so half of pages have improved that much. And that's just how much we sped up JavaScript, right? So I want to think back to where I started this conversation. One second improvement to your site makes a 27% increase in conversion rate, or at least that's what the stats tell us. This is a 100 millisecond improvement, or much more, to 50% of the web. And that is the kind of thing where browsers can make a difference for you and your products. And finally, I want to talk about one more metric that is not page load related, and which is a little bit like IMP. It's a metric we, treasure, uh, we measure and treasure um, called key press present latency. It is the time between receiving a key press from the operating system and actually presenting the result of that key press onto the screen. So it's kind of like an IMP just for key presses, right? Again, 
I will be looking at the 95th percentile. The reason for that is simple. If you're typing on Google Docs, you expect most of your key presses to be pretty much instantaneous, right? The, the, it's not that interesting to look at the median for this. But the slowest ones are the disruptive ones. And so if you look at the 95th percentile, we see the following. We see that at the start of this year, that hovered sort of around 65 milliseconds. And a bunch of improvements came in here. And now it is sitting around 59 milliseconds. A six millisecond improvement might not seem like that much. But for the 95th percentile of key presses, one out of every 20 keys that you're pushing, it means that a lot more key presses are showing up instantaneously for users today. And these are not just results that we are seeing. Google and Apple have both reported that they've seen correlations between the benchmark scores in Speedometer 3 and their real user monitoring. Apple has mentioned that in CI, Speedometer 3 has caught a regression that none of their other tests had caught, and it prevented it from shipping to their users. And so I want to thank you for being here and for talking about web performance and thinking about how to make the web fast for everyone. We are very grateful for the effort that other browser vendors have spent making this a success. I believe that I've been able to convince you that we can build a benchmark that helps us make the web better. But that doesn't mean it's done. We need the benchmark to become even better, and we need the help of the web performance community to do that. We need to know the types of things you are doing, the types of things you are planning to do, and we need to ensure that the browsers are good at doing them. Speedometer 3 is likely to be released in the spring of 2024. We're not going to change the workloads there, but there is going to be a Speedometer 4. We all are already working on it. Remember that this is all open source. You can look at it. You can look at the developments that we're making. And I hope that you all have a little bit more of an understanding now of what we as browser vendors are doing to try and make all of your pages a little faster. Thank you. I think it's time for some Q&A. Super stuff. Thank you, Baz. Do you want to, do you want to perch on a stool here? Yeah, sure. Come, and, come and take a seat. Oh. It's a little high for me. I know it is a bit high, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying not to sit here swinging my legs. And now, now that image is, has happened. So that was, that was a mistake. Um, thanks so much. It's so fascinating to get a glimpse into this aspect of browser engineering. Um, and you know, one, of the, one of the first kind of questions that came in was about the, the biggest performance wins that maybe we've seen. You showed some interesting kind of stats there about some real gains that have been made. But can you think of you know, what's the biggest performance win that you know, you've had as a browser engineer? In all of? Yeah, sure. I mean, why not dance in the, in the limelight for a second? I think the biggest for me, like for me personally, but it's not, not something that anybody ever noticed. Uh, <laughs> it was actually my own mistake. I had, I had left code in that meant we double buffered something that didn't need to be double buffered. And I fixed it, and it didn't really make things faster, but it, it prevented this extra copy, right? Th that was fast, but it used a lot of energy. And I ended up using a combination of, of telemetry and knowledge of, of electricity production mm. to calculate how much energy the planet had wasted <laughs> um, <laughs> with that extra copy over the last six years that I left that bug in. Right. And I cannot do anything anymore to, okay. to make my carbon <laughs> footprint any worse, okay. to be honest. Yeah. That's, well, what a, what a, what <laughs> but that a, was my favorite bug to fix. It was I'm, quite easy as well. I, lo I love the answer <laughs> of, of like, my best gain is fixing my biggest disaster. That's great. I mean, I, I think we can all relate to that in, in some aspect. But actually, that leads me uh, on to another question I had since, since you were talking about performance games that we've seen in terms of speed and efficiency. And I was wondering... Do we also are measurements being made specifically about energy consumption as well, or I mean, can we can we just correlate the two so it's faster, so it uses less energy? Or I, I'm just wondering I, about the specifics of that because it feels like a really important topic as we, it as is, we use the web. It more is and more. really important, right? I think that uh, uh, 
as far as we publicly know, and uh, the people from Google can disagree with me if they should, they should do so publicly if I'm wrong, uh, but I think that Microsoft has been the, the party that has historically done the most measurements on this mm -hmm. that have been made public. Um, we do try to do some measurements, but they're not automated. I'm, I'm not sure what Google is doing at the moment. So we're, we're not really measuring that, but we do believe that the amount of CPU cycles that you use is a pretty good proxy. And we do use those as a, as a proxy in our real user monitoring as well, actually looking at, so not at the speed, right, but the actual right. cycles in total that you used. Right. And that's complicated because if you're using multiple cores at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you might be using a, in total slightly more cycles, but you could still be more energy efficient if yeah. it means that that particular execution unit can be powered down more quickly, right? So it's a little bit, it's a very tricky domain. Um, we could definitely be doing better, yeah. I think. Um, it's, and it's, so, it feels like a... But speedometer doesn't really take it into account, right? Sure. Also, because we can't even. One of the problems is that if you get any idle time in the benchmark, mm -hmm. the CPU starts throttling down. And so if you would leave idle time, you could become faster, have more idle time, and get a lower score. Because by the time right. you get to the next workload, yeah. the CPU has throttled down more, and so it needs to throttle back up. And that goes directly against the idea of a higher score means a better sure. performance. Sure, right? it turns out this stuff's complicated. Who knew? <laughs> uh, yeah, who knew? Um, uh, so it, it's almost like, you know, it is a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? The fact that devices are getting more powerful, you know, we're putting more and more effort into, you know, making them more efficient and being able to uh, crunch, crunch more data and, you know, be faster with the, the CPU, CPUs or the CPU and GPUs, exactly. Um, as the tools that we as developers get access to get richer and you know we have you know you showed like fr frameworks and meta frameworks being used as well um I, I wonder to what extent as we see some of those libraries and frameworks get very popular does, does that does that dictate or lead browser engineering to kind of cater specifically for those over and above or as well as the, the platform itself um and and is that a good or a bad thing i just i wonder what's what's leading what I think that the reality is that frameworks are largely leading the browsers. I know that, that Google has at least some, some contacts with the React team. Uh -huh. uh, we don't. Like, we just need to make fast whatever the web throws at us, right? We, we don't. Right now, we don't have those connections. So I think they're leading to some extent. I think that... I think it's going to be hard to, to make power usage improvements specifically geared towards you know, the way that frameworks use the web. I think uh -huh. something that lots of speakers here have mentioned is do less things with SBAs. Uh, the last talk obviously talked about that a little bit, is going to have a significant impact right. on your energy consumption. Uh, right. Which may not help you directly, but it's going to help the planet. So right. you know, it's still going to help all of us. Yeah, um, and and there were there were some questions as well about you know how uh, atomic and how um, uh, specific some of the things are that uh, that get benchmarked in 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 speedometer, uh, such as I mean, do you go down to the level of well how how quickly can we uh, render image like an image or nope. a uh, a video no we very explicitly don't do that because okay. you get that risk of overfitting for one specific thing that you decide to measure so we when 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 for example if we take the to do mvc benchmark right we add an item to the list and then we just measure how long all of it takes the adding it to the tree yeah. uh, you know whatever frame we do the hydration all of that it's just one big measurement uh -huh. and we try to capture it all using that synchronous and asynchronous block. Got you. And if we look at something um, more like the editor workload, right? I think what we do is we bowl a whole bunch of the text or something along those lines. Okay. But we, we do that and we measure the whole thing. We try to measure the painting of that. We try to measure all the updates that means storing it, all that stuff, right? Um, so we're very explicitly not Understood. Trying to do those kind of measures. Okay, my very, very final question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, 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 Speedometer 3 being open source. Uh, what's, what's the best way that people can contribute to this or, or help? Is it in defining some of these scenarios and workloads or something else? I think there's a number of things. I think contributing user journeys that you believe are really important on the web and that we are not currently testing would be a good one. I think telling us if we're 
like we develop these these applications, but but we're not really web application engineers generally, right? We come at it from a very different perspective. If we've made mistakes in terms of the best practices that we believe we've applied, that's really useful feedback. But we also have room in the repository for experimental workloads. So if people want to contribute a full workload, uh, like a full application with a workload, that's fine. And, and there's an experimental branch that this can go on. It, it's not guaranteed that it gets into the benchmark, uh, but it makes it easier for browser vendors to measure. And in the long run, who knows, it might make for a workload that actually gets benchmarked. Excellent. And into the score. Right. Valuable contributions uh, all around. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. You, I think you're going to make yourself available up at the, the, the speaker table uh, around sometime during the lunch break. Uh, so uh, if you didn't get some of your questions uh, asked and answered, uh, then you can uh, certainly uh, come and go and find Baz during the lunch break. But for now, thanks again for a wonderful talk. Uh, everyone, a giant round of applause, please, for Baz Shouten.